Good morning, everybody. This is Donna Prosser with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and we're excited to bring you another COVID-19 update today. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Dr. Ronan Kelly from Baylor Scott & White, Dr. Jerrica Lamb from the Chapman School of Pharmacy, and Dr. Jeff Dunn from Redivis Health. And so I'd like to ask the panelists to, uh, in, in order of appearance on this slide, if you would introduce yourself, Dr. Kelly. Are you there, Dr. Kelly? Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Dr. Ronan Kelly. I'm the Chief of Oncology at Baylor Scott & White Health, which is the largest not-for-profit health system in Texas. And I'm helping to lead our COVID-19 therapeutic task force across 52 hospitals in Texas. So I was invited to attend this webinar yesterday to give an update on some of our clinical trials that we're offering patients across our system. Great. Well, we're excited to hear about that. Thank you. And, um, and Jerrica. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jerrica Lam, and I'm an associate professor at the Chapman University School of Pharmacy. My involvement with COVID-19, the Patient Safety COVID-19 Task Force, I guess has been about over a, a little bit over a month now with uh, with Donna and, and the team. And I am an ID specialist, uh, pharmacist, uh, in, uh, basically specializing in viral infections. And uh, today I'm just going to piggyback on what Dr. Kelly is going to talk about in terms of other clinical trials that are going on in the country as well as in other, uh, in other countries around the world. Great, thank you. Okay, and Jeff. Hey guys, uh, Dr. Jeff Dunn here. Um, calling in from the middle of America in Kansas City. Uh, my background is I'm a hospitalist, serving telehospitalist uh, market right now for COVID-19. Also, I'm a physician entrepreneur that has decision su uh, support software. Um, so happy to be here and thanks for having me. Great, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate everybody being here today. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as everybody is well aware, we are now into week six uh, since the World Health Organization has identified COVID-19 as a pandemic. This is the most recent World Health Organization map showing the spread across the globe. Um, you'll see here um, at the bottom of the page, there is a link to the situation reports at the World Health Organization. So, uh, so this is really great information for everybody. Every 24 hours, they report, they uh, post another new report of what's been happening in, uh, in the last 24 hours. So the great thing is that even though it is spreading, there hasn't been any new country or area who's reported the case since April 11th, so that's great. Um, but there's no shortage of information that's out there. There's, there's so much information that um, I think that's one of the challenges is helping everybody to disseminate the information that's really important. So what we've done here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, um, you'll see on, our, uh, on this link here for COVID resources, um, it, it'll link you to our website so that you can see some of the different uh, uh, documents that we have assembled for you. Um, I am trying to click on it right this second. There we go. Okay. And so you can, so what you'll be able to see is that we now have these helpful resources that are dependent on each population. So for the general public, for the, uh, for the clinicians, hospitals, and for patients who are currently in the hospital, we have different information. So I invite you to go to those pages and find out more about what we're doing at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation to keep you updated on what's happening with COVID. And please share those pages on social media. I appreciate that. Um, we, and so, so, so for today's purposes, what we do, everybody is well aware by now, um, we do an assessment every week to identify what it is that our network needs to hear the most. And this week, what we heard was that people really are interested in learning more about the therapies and treatments and any clinical trials that are underway. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, if you'll let us know about what the current clinical trials are at Baylor Scott & White. Thank you. And so when this emergency um, happened, what we decided to do was to put together a multidisciplinary team 
of experts across our system, which I'm sure every other group is doing, but because there's not one group of doctors that really is, is specifically caring for this, it's really a team approach. Our, our task force is comprised of infectious disease doctors, uh, cardiologists, pulmonologists, oncologists, hematologists, uh, intensive care doctors, emergency room physicians, and really everyone in between. Um, it's to try to bring a true multidisciplinary focus to uh, trying to offer our patients the best available clinical trials that are out there. Now, there's been an explosion in trials. There's been an explosion in the, in the amount of publications. And so for one or two people to try to keep an eye on all the publications that are coming out would be impossible task. So this multidisciplinary group meets every evening, uh, tries to uh, update people on what they found, and then we're, we're trying to position ourselves to be able to offer our patients what we think are the best clinical trials that we can. And we utilize this network of doctors because each doctor may have a different contact in a pharmaceutical company. Um, we, we reach out to different companies, and I think that way we've been very successful in getting as many trials open as we can, really in record time. So we divided our group of trials into a number of different buckets or categories. And um, the first category is the antivirals and what, um, as we know, um, when, you, when you treat viral infections, you want to have an antivirus therapy which can try to stop the virus from dividing. So the, the, we only have one trial in that bucket, that's the remdesivir study that everyone has probably been reading about overnight with um, the stock markets are all up on the hope that uh, this drug uh, is working. Um, we uh, have, were one of the first to open this trial. We have it open in multiple centers, uh, one of the largest enrollers in the US. Um, and, and so far, you know, I can't really talk about data, but what we've seen published is in the New England Journal of Medicine last Friday, there was uh, data on a um, small amount of patients, uh, which looked promising. Um, all doctors in the world, however, will tell you we need to see larger data sets and we need to see what we call these randomized phase studies where you compare what you think is a good drug to a placebo to make sure that there's not a lot of um, bias which can be introduced results. What I mean by that is were patients on that drug just going to get better on their own or are they really getting better as a result of the drug? And so um, we do have that remdesivir study. It's, it's probably, if you, if you were to categorize the drugs that we think are the most promising, that would certainly be at the, at the top. Um, but I think every doctor in the world is just waiting to see those larger data sets. What we've been hearing so far is it looks good. We are seeing some people who are on ventilators coming off ventilators. We are seeing people who don't need to get to that ICU stage getting better quicker. Um, the idea for this drug is it tries to stop the virus from replicating once it gets inside the cells. And so if you can, if you can do that, you could try to stop the, the virus in its tracks. So shutting down its, its, its ability to replicate and to divide and to, to, to then infect another cell. That's how this drug works. So that's our top antivirus drug. Um, and I think we'll see more data emerging on this in the next couple of weeks. Um, if the larger data sets look good, and I'll get, you know, we'll wait to see because every doctor will tell you we've seen some small studies that look very promising, and then when you give it in larger data sets, it's not as promising. But we're really hopeful this drug will be effective, and if it is, uh, it could be the first drug we get FDA approval for. So we'll have to wait and see, but that's our top antivirus at the moment. Um, do you want me to pause there or just keep going on the different trial categories that we have? Yeah, no, I think we would be very interested to know what all of you guys are working on there. Okay, so that's the antivirus category. Then everyone else has been hearing about convalescent plasma. Um, you know, what that is, is patients who have recovered um, from this uh, virus, and people, when they recover, they generate antibodies against the virus. Um, and the whole idea of taking blood from those patients that have recovered is, can you harness the power of their immune system, which is now fighting back against the cancer, 
and take those antibodies which that patient has created in their blood and then give it to a more vulnerable patient to help them when their immune system is low. And so the hope there is that those um, antibodies that we can take from someone else and give to a different patient can help them in that critical time when they may be deteriorating and can you prevent them from deteriorating so they need to go to the ICU or need to go on a ventilator. So this is a technique which is not new in medicine. Uh, this is something that we've been doing for over 100 years. In fact, doctors in older days before the generation of antibiotics used to use this approach. Obviously, we didn't have the technology 100 years ago that we have now, um, but it's an approach that was actually done in 1918. We've heard about the other pandemic that went through the US and around the world, the Spanish flu. It was an approach that was done there. Um, in recent years, we've seen small reports that it looked to be effective against other diseases like Ebola and like the, the, the SARS and MERS. Um, we don't ever have huge amounts of data on this because those outbreaks were relatively small and they did tend to go away pretty quickly. So if people ask, why don't we have large data sets on this approach? It's because um, the most recent pandemics were contained. So this approach is available now in the United States in three ways. The first one is uh, the FDA have allowed doctors, if they have a critical patient, to give them what's called emergency use plasma. So if the doctors can get blood from a donating patient that's recovered from COVID-19, they can give the plasma to a patient. And that's on an individual basis. It's not, it's not a clinical trial. It's called emergency or compassionate use where um, you can give this therapy to try to help a patient who's in desperate need. And so a number of our hospitals in Texas have done that, but it's, it is a little bit laborsome and cumbersome because you need to, you need to constantly be applying to the FDA for approval on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I don't really see that as a path forward. So there's two other paths forward. There's clinical trials, and you know I've written a couple of clinical trials on this already, which we don't have open yet, but we hope the FDA will approve this week. Um, one is for patients in relatively early stage in the disease course, so if they need to be admitted to the hospital, but they're not needing high flow oxygen or needing ventilators, we're gonna give those patients um, this convalescent plasma in an attempt to keep them out of the ICU, to keep them away from needing a ventilator. I hope that study can open in the next couple of weeks. Um, we submitted it to the FDA about three weeks ago. They came back with a series of comments and we've, we've made all the alterations that they asked us to and so we've resubmitted it and I hope to hear in the next couple of days. Um, you do have to compare though that to something uh, which is not the plasma. So the current standard of care is the doctors treat patients uh, according to what they think is the best way to treat it on April 17, 2020. Uh, so we're comparing that plasma in those early patients to what's called standard of care to see if it's beneficial because we don't know yet. Um, and so that study is ongoing in, 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 in Dallas and in trader, trader hospitals in Texas and hopefully in the next couple of days. And then the last way to do this is uh, the Mayo Clinic have partnered with the FDA and they've, they've, they're creating what's called a expanded access program, which means the FDA have basically approved one protocol for the country. And doctors can sign up for this throughout the United States. And the protocol has already been approved by the FDA. Um, it, it's kind of regulated by Mayo Clinic. Um, but you sign up online and then you can act, they can, there's gonna be one, the, the Red Cross are participating, other blood banks throughout the country are participating and, and volunteer donors can go donate plasma if they meet all the correct entry criteria. And then there, there will be a pool of plasma, if you will, around the United States that you, if you're in Chicago or LA or Dallas or wherever you are, you can apply for this plasma and it can be shipped to your hospital and you can give it to your patient. So there are the three ways, the compassionate use, clinical trials, and then on this national expanded access program. So um, that's really where we are with the convalescent plasma. I'm also writing a study actually to give this plasma to, 
to frontline workers who are considered high risk in the attempt to try to uh, prevent them from getting sick. Um, so th I don't have that protocol open, but that's something I've just submitted to the FDA and others are doing that around the United States. Um, you know, that's an approach that we do in medicine. If frontline workers get a, a needle stick injury from a patient with hepatitis B, uh, you can often get what we call immunoglobulins, which are, again, antibodies to try to prevent the patient, or excuse me, the frontline worker from getting hepatitis B. We also do this in other diseases like rabies and botulism. So it, it's, it is an approach that we do to protect our frontline workers. So we're going to see if that also is helpful. Um, so that's really bucket two. So the first bucket was the, was the viruses, the antiviral treatment, which was the remdesivir. Then the convalescent plasma is bucket number two. We do have a number of other um, ways to try to prevent, help our frontline workers. We've been giving them hydroxychloroquine which people will be familiar with. President Trump has mentioned this many times. It's the malaria drug. We're, we're giving this to um, our frontline workers and we've, we've enrolled about 150 frontline workers on a trial. So we're gonna see, again, the control arm there is uh, the frontline workers that decide not to get the hydroxychloroquine, but they do like to get the nasal swabs to see if they're infected. So we have uh, a group that want to get the hydroxychloroquine and then a group of doctors and nurses that have decided they don't want to get the drug but do like to get the screening, so the testing. So that study's been open for a few weeks and we're enrolling well and others again have that one. Um, and then the last one we're working on just to protect our frontline workers is uh, people have been hearing about BCG vaccination. Again, you showed the map of the world there. Um, the United States does not have a BCG vaccination for our children to prevent against tuberculosis, but many other countries around the world do. It's a standard part of their vaccine when the kids are growing up. There's emerging data that potentially giving this BCG vaccine uh, may help against other diseases, not just tuberculosis, which it's designed to do, but to prevent against other infections and including some viruses. So in Australia, for example, they've just launched a phase three trial in a number of over 4,000 healthcare doctors, where there are nurses and doctors, where they're giving them actually BCG to adults, not to children. They're giving these frontline doctors and nurses BCG vaccine to try to boost their immune system, to try to prevent them from getting sick with COVID-19. Now people will say, yeah, but it's not a vaccine against COVID-19. And the answer is yes, it's not a vaccine, what we're all waiting for against the, this new coronavirus but it's an interim measure to give people uh, a stimulated immune response. So our frontline workers who are exposed daily may be able to get some boosted immune system and it could fight the disease before it becomes a, a problem for them. So, so there are kind of things that we're doing in prophylaxis, as I said, just to summarize that, it's the um, BCG type vaccinations, convalescent plasma and hydroxychloroquine. Then for patients, as they, as they get this disease, the other bucket we've been looking at is something called immune modulators. One of the problems patients get, probably in the second week with this disease, and you've, you've been hearing on the news, oh, he was getting better or she was getting better, and then suddenly they deteriorated. And that's because what can happen with this disease is, believe it or not, our immune system gets turned on too much. And that can be bad in some instances when people, um, their immune, it, the immune system goes into overdrive. We call this a cytokine storm, which basically means there's this flooding of, of, of um, uh, chemicals, if you will, released from our immune cells, which cause patients to have lung damage and start having uh, severe respiratory difficulties and their oxygen levels can decrease. And it can be a, almost like a vicious circle because once the lungs start failing, then other systems can start failing, including the kidneys and the heart and the blood pressure can drop. And so that's an important part for us to try to control that overstimulated immune response. Just so your, your listeners can be clear, we want the immune system to kick in very early on to try to prevent infection. But what's happening in some of these patients is as they get into the second or third week, that immune system can kick in too much and cause too many problems. 
So a lot of our trials are designed to try to dampen down that overstimulated immune response in those patients that are really quite sick and going towards ventilation. And so we have lots of drugs targeting different parts of that cytokine storm. In fact, we have about seven or eight different uh, uh, drugs that are targeting specific parts. I won't go through all the drugs, but they, they basically are all designed to do the same thing. If someone's immune system is too stimulated and is resulting in damage to their organs and to their body, can we dampen down some of that immune response so they don't run into all those problems? So um, that's another bucket that we're looking at. And then we have a number of other, uh, what we call other categories. Um, one of them involves mesenchymal stem cells, which again, not to get too technical, but the idea here is to give these, um, these cells, which can migrate to people's lungs and can dampen down the immune response. We're also looking at um, uh, other drugs that may help open up people's airways. And uh, people have been hearing about different ways to position patients in terms of turning them on their belly, which is called a prone position to try to help the lungs oxygenate better. Um, but that's kind of just a snapshot of all the different trials we're doing. In total, we, you know, we have trials that are constantly opening and closing because some of these studies are relatively small and some of the larger studies are on a competitive basis, which means every system is trying to enroll patients on these trials. So part of our strategy is to have an eye on the future to try to understand, okay, if that trial is going to close, can we open another trial so that the next generation of patients have an opportunity to participate in some trials as well. So it's constantly trying to keep um, trials uh, open and, and having an eye in the future. Oh, that's, uh, you guys are doing some amazing work there at Baylor Scott and White. Thank you for that summary. Um, I do, there is a question that, that we have from, um, from the audience. Um, the question is about whether or not the clinical trials are primarily focused on high risk patients versus um, those that are, are considered potentially low risk. Uh, can you address that in terms of how you're choosing which patients are in the studies? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. In fact, some of the trials are just for what we call moderate risk and some are for high risk. And the, the way we divide it up is depending on how, how well a patient is doing. So if a patient is early in their disease course or is not, is having maybe a slight difficulty breathing, but is not having to need high levels of oxygen, um, and their, their, their breathing rate is not too strained, they would be considered in the moderate risk. And then if someone, you know, is their oxygen levels are decreasing, they've gone to the ICU, they're on a ventilator, they're at the severe risk. So some of the trials are, are categorizing patients in the moderate risk, and some are putting them into that high risk. What think is these drugs will work better earlier in the disease course. It kind of makes sense to try to intervene at an early stage before someone gets really sick. And so, um, as I said, I would almost think of this as three different categories, right? So you've got the prophylaxis category, which is try to prevent someone getting sick at all in the first place, which is what we hope a vaccine will do. Um, but until we get that vaccine, as I said, we have a couple of different categories, including an interim vaccine with a BCG type approach. We have convalescent we have hydroxychloroquine. Then the next category is, okay, someone gets sick. Can we intervene straight away? You know, if they thought maybe they could ride this out, they're at home, but then they get too sick and they come into the hospital, but they're not needing high levels of oxygen. So that's the moderate risk category. Let's give them medicines there to try to make sure they don't need to go to ICU. And so some trials are definitely just looking at that group of patients. But then there is obviously some that no matter what we do, they, they get worse. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time, how do we rescue those patients? How do we help them in their time of need? And so that's, I really think that's those immune modulators. That's the category of trying to shut down their overactive immune response. And so that's why we have a lot of trials in that category as well. 
Um, well, I know that you have to jump off here um, at before 8.30. So we just have one more question that I, I hope you can address. Um, the question is re regarding the plasma trials that you were talking about. Is there any evidence or does anybody have any uh, understanding of how long folks may have antibodies for and how well those antibodies are truly protective? So that's another great question because that's something that we think about a lot right now. You, you don't want to just give plasma to someone um, and not know what, what, what we call the, the antibody titer level is. So what that means is how much antibodies has a donor created? So if you had 10, 10 people that have recovered from this disease, you know, you may have a category of a couple of, of, of those individuals would have recovered very well, would have a high level of, of antibodies in their, in their blood when they may be able to help those vulnerable patients. But then some of those other uh, people that have recovered, they may have recovered and not really generated a huge amount of antibodies. And so if you give their plasma to a patient, it may not help them a huge amount. So one of the things we're all working on right now is to be able to measure the, what we call the antibody titers. How many antibodies are in a donor's plasma so that we would only give plasma to vulnerable patients if we think it's going to work by making sure that the highest amount of antibodies are in that plasma. In terms of how long does a patient, or excuse me, how long does a, a person who recovers from this disease remain uh, with high antibodies? We just don't know that yet. Um, there's a lot about this disease we don't know. Um, we don't know if people can get reinfected uh, if they've recovered. So I think it's almost, we're all in this together. We're going to learn this over the next couple of months. We just don't know. We don't have answers to all those questions. But I hope I was able to help answer the first part of the question in that you want to make sure when you give plasma to a, a, a patient that it's the antibody levels are at a certain threshold and we want to make sure we can measure those before we give it to a patient. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that you have to go. There are a few more questions, but I think that um, for the I audience- I can for a few more minutes if you need me to. Okay, well, um, we, we can uh, uh, keep going then with, um, with um, some more information about recommended medications and other trials that may be happening out there. And then I think as we go through the, the, some of the next few slides, we're going to answer some of the questions that have been coming through, but please keep your questions coming. Um, all right, Dr. Lamb, do you want to tell us a little bit about, um, about the recommended medications and, and other things? all COVID. Yes, thank you very much, Donna. Um, so, so basically uh, what, what has been presented earlier was very comprehensive and very, uh, very, very uh, nice. And I just wanted to allude to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation COVID-19 Treatment Summary that uh, we've created as a, as a team here. And this just summarizes Again, uh, we all agree that the treatment, the therapeutic trials are ongoing and um, information is constant, rapidly evolving, as we know, on almost a daily basis. So what Donna is showing to, to you right now is a table of the various drugs that are being trialed uh, throughout the country as well as throughout the world in many, uh, in, in many areas, uh, you know, in, in terms of medical centers, as well as private sectors too. And um, what was touched upon were hydroxychloroquine, as well as um, remdesivir, which I heard on the news today that it, it does have some modest promise. And so we just need to have more, um, more a larger sample size to determine its true efficacy. But, but that is a, a drug that uh, people are crossing their fingers and hoping that there might be some hope down the road in, in terms of an antiviral treatment against the um, uh, COVID-19. What I want to add on to um, what was talked about in terms of vaccine was uh, another vaccine that's uh, actually started in the United States, actually in, around March is the M, uh, mRNA, messenger RNA vaccine, the 1273. That was a collaboration between Mo Moderna company and Kaiser and that the site was held in Seattle, uh, Washington state. And uh, right now phase one tr uh, trial is currently going on and it has about 45 adult, healthy adult enrollees in that trial. And phase one vaccine trial is just to test the safety 
of this uh, messenger RNA vaccine just to see if, if uh, the, the volunteers who are receiving different doses of this vaccine are found to be safe. And this vaccine actually is different from uh, traditional vaccines that have been created, is that it is actually a um, synthetic, synthesized version of, of this uh, SARS-CoV virus, CoV-2 virus. And it actually looks at, um, it encodes this um, pro, uh, prefusion spike protein that actually what we are learning more about this virus, the coronavirus, is that it uses a spike protein to enter the epithelial lung cells. And so this mRNA-1273 vaccine is used to basically trigger an immune response in these healthy volunteers to see if it can block the entry of the real coronavirus uh, into their lungs. So this is, again, an open label, small trial that's going on, and it's been, been conducted for about almost six weeks now. So hopefully we'll get preliminary data sometime maybe towards the end of this month, but uh, I think more realistically sometime in May that we'll get some, some preliminary data from the phase one trial. Another trial that has been touched upon uh, as part of an immunomodulator class is uh, the toxilizumab, which we've heard about uh, Actemra. And this is an immunomodulator, uh, what Dr. Renner has referred to in terms of um, targeting the various cytokines. As we understand is that there's also this cytokine storm, this surge of cytokines that actually uh, is released when patients are severely ill uh, with COVID-19. And so uh, I think several days ago, we've heard that there was an ER physician from Seattle, um, from Washington State, who has recovered from receiving toxilizumab or Actemra. And he, he was near uh, death's door. And basically he received this infusion uh, of this medication and he recovered and he's actually a testament of the novel therapies that are being used by a lot of clinicians and scientists. And so um, there is a trial that is going on right now in the United States. And uh, just to let you know, uh, there are many strategies to attack this virus. It's not just one strategy, but many multi-pronged strategy. And so I am very encouraged that hopefully maybe by the end of this year or early next year, we'll have some form of therapeutic treatment before the vaccine actually gets approved sometime in 2021. So um, as what Donna has alluded to in sharing that table, uh, what we're going to do as a task force, a COVID-19 task force, is to update this to reflect the current trials that are ongoing, as well as uh, potential future treatments that are being tested against COVID-19. And this is available on the web page as well for everyone to use and access. And uh, we are welcoming feedback to this table and, and, and this summary page so that we can, uh, we can educate and inform everyone about what is going on because we're, we're all in this together to make sure that everyone gets factual information as well as evidence-based science behind what is going on in terms of treatment. Great. Thank you, Jerrica. That's fabulous. Um, I, there is a question about related to trials. Uh, do you have any advice, and, and this would be either to Dr. Lam or to Dr. Kelly, um, any advice for people who might be interested in participating in trials? Who can, who, who can apply and how do people go about being in a clinical trial? That's a good one. I would defer to Dr. Kelly, who has more experience in this. Um, well, you yeah, know, it's a good question because, you know, I guess it depends on where people are living and their geographic area. Um, clearly, pe not everyone needs a trial, right? I think that's important. To, a lot of, most people will recover from this disease staying at home. And, you know, we, we know that everyone hears those stories every day. Um, but if you do need to go to a hospital, um, you would certainly encourage, uh, certainly ask them if you have any clinical trials available. Because remember, there's no FDA approved treatment for this disease as yet. So all of these treatments that we talk about have to be done on a clinical trial. And, you know, it's a, it's a typical question to answer because I know your listeners are from everywhere and I'm not able to really comment on what different hospitals and different states have. But, 
Um, you know, a, a lot of these uh, are going up on, on hospital websites. Um, you know, you can contact the hospital and see if they have trials. But as I said, the vast majority of people hopefully will never need a trial. They can get this and, and ride it out at home. But if you do go to a hospital and ask them, you know, if they have trials available. Um, and if not, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe your, 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 your website may be able to put up where trials are available. Um, there is a website, of course, um, a, a national website called clinicaltrials.gov. So that's an NIH sponsored uh, website. It's a government sponsored website, uh, www.clinicaltrials.gov. Um, it's not the easiest to navigate in terms of, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming when patients um, type in COVID-19 trials and they may see a whole explosion of trials because there's now hundreds. But it may be somewhat helpful if someone has time to identify their particular geographical area and to be able to see which hospitals in their state have trials ongoing. And so, you know, then if you were going to get sick, you may have a preference to go to one hospital over another, but that's the only way I can really tell on clinical trials, doctor. Yes, uh, I, I wanted to add to that. That's a very good point, Dr. Kelly. Um, Donna, if you go and, and click on the treatment summary, the clinicaltrials.gov, actually on that table, I've listed, if you scroll right there, yes. So there are clinical trials that uh, I've actually uh, taken out from that website and posted on the summary page. So whomever is interested, whether they're living in Turkey, Brazil, China, the US, there these trials are currently going on or the investigators, principal investigators are asking for volunteers. So if you cl click on the hyperlink, it will route you to that after a trial on the clinicaltrials.gov site. And if you scroll all the way down onto that page uh, for the particular clinical trial, there is a contact person that you can either give them, the, uh, give them a call or email them. They do have contact information there. So, uh, so that's a helpful resource too. If, if you know of someone who really needs to be enrolled in a trial, and many of these trials are placebo randomized controlled trials. Some of them are smaller trials and they're open label trials, but um, this web page is, is uh, or the summary page is meant to offer some guidance for those who want to be enrolled, as well as perhaps maybe find more information for collaboration and, and partnerships. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I was trying to click on this and it's not going to that page. So um, for everybody on the call, just know we're going to we're going to check that and make sure that those links are working this morning. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit more about, about actual treatment. Um, it, you know, most of our hospitalists and our intensivists these days are working around the clock to care for these patients in hospitals. So Dr. Jeff Dunn, we've got with us today, who's a hospitalist. So Dr. Dunn, you want to tell us a little bit about what people need to do to care for these people right now? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I want to say that um, being a hospitalist, we are um, termed with knowing a little about a lot. Um, and I can tell you that this disease, there's a lot of fluid stuff going on with this. So from our perspective, uh, we couldn't do it without our nurse colleagues, uh, respiratory therapist colleagues, or our critical care colleagues in, in managing this disease. It's very much a team sport. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the bullets of taking care of these patients. Um, what we have seen is, along with the common symptoms of cough, fever, um, shortness of breath, many times um, these folks are having GI symptoms as well as uh, loss of taste or smell. Um, the, what we're seeing also in the timeline of when they become symptomatic, many times after that seven days is when uh, the patients get in trouble. So from our perspective, from being a hospitalist, when you admit somebody to the hospital that needs a small requirement of oxygen, um, our ears start to perk up when those oxygen needs start to go up. And I would say that um, that three to four liters of oxygen um, is, is usually a sign that that patient may need, um, may be at high risk of decompensating and may need to be put in the ICU um, for further um, observation. So 
Uh, to talk about the second bullet, usually we see sepsis um, from a bacterial pathogen, and uh, many times the sepsis bundle um, is, uh, you know, IV antibiotics, uh, lactates, labs, IV fluids, etc. Um, this cytokine dysregulated response is from a virus this time. I will tell you that uh, many of the treatments uh, that the other panelists have been talking about have showed some promise. Uh, but the one thing that uh, we would like to know more about is when these patients get really, really sick, what's working with those folks, the people that are on a ventilator or a ventilator plus hemodialysis. So we are putting uh, quite, a, quite a few folks on empiric antibiotics uh, because these folks look like severe sepsis or septic shock at times, and it's hard to decipher whether they are co-infected with the bacteria as well. Um, the last one I'll talk about is the ARD ARDS syndrome, and uh, Dr. Kelly talked about the cytokine storm. Uh, some of these folks are having five lobe infiltrates that uh, look very dense on a chest x-ray. Some of them have disproportionate hypoxia um, as well, where the hypoxia is disproportionately uh, to what their chest x-ray looks like. So I will tell you that not everyone has a bad looking chest x-ray. And at a lot of the sites, um, they're, not do, they're not following the chest x-ray, it's more following the, the amount of hypoxia. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. Um, and the treatment modalities, just to talk um, really generalistic um, from a hospitalist perspective, um, hemodynamic support, People do uh, have shock syndrome um, with this that's much like septic shock. Um, we are using uh, norepinephrine as our first line, vasopressin as a second. And um, like, uh, unlike bacterial sepsis where you rapidly and aggressively fluid resuscitate, um, we are using a very cautious IV fluid um, uh, protocol with these patients. Uh, you don't want, uh, obviously, to, to put too much in the tank with these folks. Um, the other thing with the amount of um, cytokine dysregulation, we're also considering that there might be a microthrombotic phenomenon going on with these patients that's, uh, you know, uh, a cause or an etiology behind that disproportionate hypoxia. So the other thing to watch out is everyone needs DVT prophylaxis. We've had some folks in reports of patients getting clots as well um, with the more severe uh, COVID response. Obviously, with the ventilator support, uh, we are counting very much on our uh, critical care folks to be able to manage those. And Dr. Kelly talked about the proning, um, et cetera, the high PEEP, uh, low tidal volume that you typically do with ARDS. But to, to further kind of um, talk about that disproportionate hypoxia to the chest X-ray as well. And lastly, those, those three things that were uh, eloquently talked about by the other panelists about hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir um, trials. We do have uh, one of the academic centers that's doing a hydroxychloroquine trial here, University of Kansas. Um, and the, the promising results from remdesivir that has recently come out. Um, uh, and I, I think that, uh, from my standpoint, we need to have tempered expectations on even remdesivir and, and need more of a sample size to be able to say that uh, this is going to be a, a very successful and an impactful drug here. And then lastly, uh, plasma from survivors, which uh, we have not given, but uh, there's reports that uh, this is doing wonders for really some really, really sick patients. So um, that's, that's kind of a generalist update on uh, COVID and the telehospitalist uh, phenomenon. Great, well, thank you. That's fabulous information. Um, we do have several questions that are coming in from our audience. Um, so lots of questions about hydro, um, hydroxychloroquine. Um, is it, 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 there was a clarification about whether or not this is being used on ventilated patients or uh, patients who are more stable? Yeah, so from my perspective, hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, I, I think that this drug is, is better suited for folks with mild disease um, rather than severe and critical disease. Um, again, 
we don't have a lot of patients that are on this. This is for the clinical trial folks. Uh, we can use it with the help of our infectious disease colleagues. But anecdotally, from what I'm reviewing, is this, this one probably isn't going to move the needle as much as the others when it comes to the, those critically ill patients that are on a ventilator or a ventilator uh, with hemodialysis. But I'd defer to uh, uh, Erica or uh, Dr. Kelly on uh, what the clinical trials are actually, actually showing. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, this, is a, this is a treatment that will work better in early stage patients because the mechanism of how we think it works is it inhibits the virus from entering the cells and it also is changing some of the acidification in part of the intracellular machinery that the virus needs to replicate. So what I mean by that is if someone is at the, towards the latter stage where they're in the ICU, the virus has already got in and it's multiplied by billions, right? So it's not really going to work that well. You want to give this earlier in the disease course to try to minimize the ability of the virus to replicate. So anything that we're seeing is that this treatment will be better in the early stages of the diseases rather than the latter stages. Right. So then can it be inferred then that somebody who's already taking hydroxychloroquine for another, another disease process may have a, an additional layer of protection? Well, so, so that question has come up because this drug is approved for patients with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and there is data sets emerging. But again, you know, what, whenever you're in a pandemic like this, it's hard, you know, there's a lot of small data sets emerging. And it's only after the fact where we really get the hardcore data that we can truly believe in. But what we have seen is that those patients, there may be a slight protective effect in that group of patients that have rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. However, those are also a little bit more vulnerable because they're immunosuppressed. Certainly the rheumatoid arthritis patients are. So I think we need to see more data, uh, but to answer your question, we think there may be a hint of activity in those groups that already take it. Excellent. Uh, Dr. John, I wonder if you could talk about um, the use of ECMO um, in, in these patients. Are, are, are you finding that that is a common practice with COVID-19? I would say it's not common practice, but uh, ECMO uh, reports are suggesting that some of the uh, younger patients that are critically ill from the disease, um, they are actually being plugged into ECMO therapy. So I haven't seen it done in my practice yet. Um, but there are reports suggesting that uh, there are some places that are pretty cutting edge that are using this as a treatment modality for really sick patients. Okay, great. And then there's a question regarding, um, uh, regarding race or climate. We, we know we've heard a lot about racial disparities um, and that our minority populations are being affected more than others. Um, but what are you seeing in terms of clinical trials and treatments? Are, are, is there a difference in the response based on race or geographical location? Is that for me or for somebody else? Oh, uh, I, I guess probably Dr. Kelly. Have you noticed uh, any, any differences um, in the trials? So again, I think it's going to depend on where you live in the U.S. and what the, the breakdown of the population is. You know, what I can tell you is from our data sets uh, in, in Dallas, we've been seeing more Caucasians having this than African-Americans or Hispanics. But I think that's going to depend on where you live. And... Uh, Certainly, you're right. In some of the larger cities like New York, uh, they have seen a, a, um, a difference in, in the uh, outcomes in patients according to um, what their background is. I, I think there's a lot of work that needs to go into this. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a, a particular genomic difference. I, I, I would be surprised if there was. I mean, we, we actually think there may be a slight difference between men and women. And, you know, we can get into that a little bit, you know, but in terms of uh, two X chromosomes versus an XY chromosome and, and, and the, the amount of receptors that are available for the virus to enter. But so there's a lot of data, you know, is there a difference between men and women? Is there a difference between Caucasian, African-American, Hispanic? I, I don't think we know the answers yet. You know, we've heard, um, you know, every evening on the, on the, on the, the, the government responses, um, you know, they talk about, well, 
potentially some groups in our, in our population have more comorbidities and more diabetes and more high blood pressure and, and, and other illnesses that are going to impact how well they do. And so I think we need to tease all of that information out. We also need to tease out the information about the ability to social distance. And in some cities that are more populous, um, they've not been able to do this as, as well as some of the more open areas in the, in the country. So, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of avoiding the question a little bit because I don't want to give any misleading information. We just don't know yet. I don't know yet. Great. Um, and uh, Dr. John, I wonder if you could describe the plasma treatment uh, a little bit. Is it uh, just a standard plasma transfusion or is there a special technique? I'd probably defer that to Dr. Kelly, to be perfectly honest. We, uh, we, haven't, we haven't treated any of our patients with plasma yet, but uh, I, he, he's probably the one to talk to about that. Dr. Kelly? Sure. sure. So, the, so the process here is, and um, you need to make sure, pay, if you follow the FDA guidelines, someone needs to be, before you can donate and go to your local Red Cross, or in Dallas, we have what's called Carter Blood Care, um, you need to be 28 days, you know, post symptoms, you've recovered for 28 days. If it's 14 days since you've recovered, you need to have another test that shows that you're now negative. And things will evolve over time. We've had a problem, of course, throughout the country with testing. We all know that. Uh, but the, 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 the ability to do rapid amounts of testing will evolve over the next couple of weeks and months. So, I think we will help improve the testing issue. Um, but then if you're confirmed that you can go, uh, you go to your local blood bank, they do the normal things. They have to check you for other infections like HIV and hepatitis and all these other things that we always check when we're giving blood transfusions to patients. And then they also make sure that your blood type matches the blood type of whoever will receive your plasma. So those things are routinely done in blood, in blood banks. And then they, they take the plasma from you. It's, it's done over you know, a period of time. Um, it's pretty easy to do it in any blood transfusion service or any blood bank. And then they, they, they take the plasma and then they, they can freeze it or send it to the local hospital. And then the hospital can uh, really give it at any time. It can be frozen and stored for a period of time. Or if a patient needs it straight away, you, you give it, the nurse can hang it as an infusion. And we really are, are, well, in my protocol, we're recommending that we give it less than 500 mils an hour. Uh, so we give it relatively slowly, but at anywhere from 250 mils to 500 mils. Um, and it's just, you follow normal infusion guidelines, all nurses, all doctors, all hospital administrators. We have, uh, blood transfusion guidelines. So you just give it as you would any other blood product. You, you slowly infuse it over a period of time and, um, and then you just watch the patient and make sure that they're doing okay. Great. Is there anyone on the panel who has any information about the passing of the virus from mother to fetus? That was a question and I don't, I'm not sure if anybody would know that on this panel. Thoughts? Yeah. Well, we report in the New England Journal of Medicine about that, I think, last week. Um, I don't know if my colleagues on the panel have seen that. But, um, people are looking at that right now. Great. Well, we will definitely follow up on that and make sure that we add that information to our website for the person who asked that question. And then uh, the last question that we have is related to testing. I know we just talked a little bit, a little bit about that. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I wonder, Dr. Dunn, how do you decide in a hospital, you know, as a hospitalist, how do you decide which patients get that test and which ones don't? Yeah, I would, I would tell you it's changed quite a bit. So I, I'm on the kind of the state line between Kansas and Missouri. I would tell you that Kansas in general has, uh, has had a lot more limited testing um, than Missouri has at this point. So early on in this disease process in the March, um, mid-March, late March, uh, even up to early April, um, we were testing the very focused subset of patients that had 
essentially interaction with a, another COVID patient, uh, shortness of breath, hypoxia, fever, et cetera. It is, um, th those guidelines are loosening up a bit. So if we believe that uh, a patient has one or two of those criteria and uh, particularly hypoxic, um, those patients are getting tested right now. And I can tell you the turnaround time from the testing um, when we started was about five to seven days. So you can imagine people are sick on ventilators at times, not knowing whether we had COVID positive. That has shrunk down to considerably um, to a day or two at this point. So um, I would tell you that uh, testing uh, is, we are testing more and more people that we have clinical suspicions on. They don't have to fit every single four or five criteria at this point because I believe that uh, it, it makes the healthcare uh, workers and staff safer knowing that if a patient has a positive COVID or not. Okay. And then we also had another question, Dr. Dunn, regarding ventilation. When you're determining ventilator settings and ventilator strategies, um, how, how do you decide on, on that? Well, I can talk as a generalist here. I'm typically not the one that's managing the ventilator. That's the critical care folks. Uh, but typically what we're hearing and seeing from uh, the pulmonary critical care folks is um, like Dr. Kelly uh, mentioned, some of the proning strategies that are coming out, they're still um, running some strategies and protocols regarding the proning. Uh, but typically these folks that have the ARDS syndrome, um, high PEEP, uh, low tidal volume uh, strategies, typically, uh, you know, an, a, a typical ARDS patient is, is what the pulmonary critical care folks are using right now. Excellent. And um, and what about if, if going back to testing very very briefly? Um, have you noticed any trends in terms of false negatives? That's a good question. I think some of the data that uh, that we received is about seventy percent of true positives with the test. Still, there is some, uh, you know. Uh, folks that have the disease that are not uh, coming up positive with the test. So um, I haven't seen recently what the, what the data suggests, but there are some folks that have this disease. And if the clinical suspicion is there, they're um, COVID-19 positive unless, uh, unless proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we are right about at the top of the hour. So I am very grateful to all of you today for joining. I do believe we've answered um, most of the questions. There were a few, a few um, outstanding questions that we will uh, address on our website moving forward. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Kelly, Dr. Lamb, and Dr. Dunn for joining us today and to everybody on the phone and, and on the webinar. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to continue to, to maintain our Patient Safety Movement Foundation resources page, and we'll be adding to that over time. Um, additional video interviews and, and other webinars and, and, and such for you to join. Uh, that being said, today is going to be the last uh, of our weekly webinar series. We will continue to bring you webinars and we will continue to bring you interviews with real-time information. Uh, but we, rather than waiting for eight o'clock on a Friday morning, we will uh, we'll try to get to it as fast as possible. So more to come, you'll see it, all of that coming through our website and through our email distribution. But um, my thanks again to the panel. I very much appreciate your participation today. Great, thank you very much, Donna. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful weekend.